Cuarto desconectado. Encuentro Internacional de Investigadores en Educación Virtual. Conferencistas de Colombia, Canadá, España y Argentina. Okay, hello everyone. Um, we are here uh, to discuss about um, connectivism, MOOCs, and new trends in pedagogy, in new technologies, and how these new trends affect education, and also implications for, for instance, educational change. Uh, we have here uh, two experts in this topic. In this topic, uh, one is Stephen Downs from Canada, and also Diego Leal from Colombia. Uh, they both of them has, has been working about these topics and we would like to have a short and informal com conversation uh, about both the definition, implications for, for instance, uh, education, pedagogy, and further discussions about institutions, policies, and what happens. So, welcome. welcome. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, why don't we start about defining what is connectivism, the boundaries, the scope of this new model of thinking about learning? Okay, well, I'll begin my two-hour talk. No. <laughs> I mean, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Connectivism is the idea that everything is linked together, and that these links mean something. That knowledge is contained in the links. It's the observation that our brains are collections of neurons that are linked together, but it's also the observation that the same sort of patterns exist out there in the world. And learning is the forming of these links. Okay. So um, sometimes we talk about that. You you you, you emphasize about the, the role that our brain has, right? The, the we, we do have a neural network mm -hmm. in our heads. We don't have a concepts. We don't have a the specific place uh, of where the idea is or where the table of contents resides. Mm -hmm. But uh, we we have a. We have links, and, and we have neurons, and, and they're connected to each other. And in a way, I've heard in the past that you mentioned that uh, the outside world has a direct, I don't know, if connection or relation with what's happening inside. Uh, so sure. in terms of connectivism, how, how does that work? How, what kind of conversation is happening between the external world and the internal neural world? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean. The way I look at it, and I know I'm not alone, I read actually just recently um, Ray, Kurzweil's, Ray Kurzweil's new book, he talks about this knowledge as pattern recognition, yeah. right? And what happens when you perceive something, uh, that forms connections in your brain. Uh, it literally changes yeah. the way neurons are connected to each other, that's known as plasticity. And what happens is, as you experience things, as you practice doing things, when these connections are formed, the next time you see something similar, the next time you see the same thing, those connections are activated and you recognize, oh, it's like I've seen that before. I wonder where is located learning, actually? You say it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's a very difficult issue to, to discuss because cognitivism uh, has stated that con learning is inside. Other approaches said no, sure. it's, it's a dialogue and ecology with the environment. But finally, in terms of pedagogy assessment, what you assess is something that happens in this individual. So we try, try to try yeah. to, but this is an illusion. Or what happens with the location of learning? Where is that? Well, Nodes, connections, links are here or not? Yeah, I mean, it's like you're, it's like you're asking, you know, where, what is the location of French? Okay, yeah. <laughs> there are boundaries to define but, French. But there are but in France. Right. You know, sorry, I, mean, I mean, the French language is in France, but the French language is in my head. Je parle en français. There it is. Now yeah. the French language is here. It travels, right? There isn't a place where these things are. Uh, there's a continuum. There are instances of it. Uh, you know, there's no particular and distinct thing that we would call French. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. But, uh, I, I don't know, uh, just to, to pick up your question, um, 
in my view, learning resides in your brain. I mean, the connections are in your brain. And okay, that it's is connectivism, just to be clarified. That is connectivism. It's in your brain. I would say so. So the assumption but, of connectivism has, is in your brain. Yeah, but, but it's not like an isolated oh. brain. Okay. Because if we are connected, and I mean, globalization, just to mention an economic term, uh, has to do with everything being connected to each other. Okay. Uh, well, uh, your your head has a neural network, but there is an outside network that you can tap into. You can connect to people. You can connect to uh, knowledge, to devices. You can connect to a lot of stuff that can be. And, and these things are inter are intermediating the relationship with other people, with knowledge, so to speak. But the the thing that that I, I find really interesting is that it leads us to a point where you have connections and and things and understandings in your brain. Yes. Okay. But the knowledge of our culture is distributed. It's, distributed. it's okay. not concentrated okay. in one single place. Okay. Okay. That and that's, that's something that always yeah. comes my attention about connected yeah. okay. Anything that is a network can learn. Right? The learning is in the configuration of the network. So the learning is in our brain because our brain is a network. The learning is in society, because society is a network. The learning is in the internet, because the internet is a network. It's distributed across these networks. So a network is just more than an individual. That is interesting. Absolutely. OK, institutions. OK, there is new approaches in education nowadays about, for, exa for instance, Tara Fenwick in Edinburgh. She's talking about a sociomateriality perspective. But I wonder if we will combine connectivism and sociomateriality, it will be a critique, a critique to connectivism because, uh, or, I, or I don't know what you think about that, because connectivism assumes that everything at the end starts with a node and ends with a node, which is the individual, which is distributed. But at the end, um, what is important is to understand what is learning, and the account of that learning is going to be the individual, isn't it? I mean, we can say, we can state that the knowledge is distributed, okay? But how can we say that knowledge um, is going to be accounted in that distributed environment? Or is, do you think that is more uh, uh, that account is going to be also distributed? Or is the individual who is going to be to say, I establish new connections? Who is going to establish new connections? The individual or the network? OK, let me take this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and because I key in on the way you said, connectivism assumes that. Ah, okay. it, right. This is not an assumption. If you look in a brain, mm -hmm. open up a brain, you see neurons and connections, yes, right? Indeed, indeed. If you look at a society, you see people talking to each other. Right? This is not an assumption. These connections exist. Okay, so, so you asked. Who makes the changes in the connections? We look at the neurons, we look at people in society, and we observe how these connections form. And we know, because there's been a lot of work done, and done on it, we know that human brains, anyways, are, are what we call plastic. The connections form, they grow, and they, they break according to how the neurons interact with each other. These are electrical chemical reactions. And there are different theories, different, well, different models is a better word. For example, Hebbian connectivism, or sorry, Hebbian connectionism. And the idea is if two neurons are activated at the same time, they will form over time a connection between each other. It's, a, it's the way the mind grows. And, and similarly, you know, like Diego and I are connected. How do we become connected? Well, we look at the world and we ask, right? There was a proximity, but also we find ourselves talking at, you know, at the same events, uh, we're talking about the same things. He's firing, I'm firing. There's a connection that gets drawn. Okay. So these models are, are what creates the organization of the network. There isn't an external evaluator saying, yeah, form this connection. No, don't form that connection. It's a natural process. It's not an intentional process. This is the big difference between connectivism and, say, constructivism. In constructivism, you deliberately create or construct knowledge. But in connectivism, 
you grow knowledge through practice, through experience. Interesting. And, and you, you were talking about uh, uh, an, an assessment perspective for many like applications yeah. for pedagogy or yeah, 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 yeah. And, and and the thing is that I. I would say that there's not one knowledge. Uh, there, there is a social knowledge that is, I don't know, a representation in, in information devices and artifacts of the things we know as a species. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's accumulating a long time, obviously, and now it's exploding and, and all that. Uh, but there is also a personal knowledge, something, the things that you know and the things that you can contribute with to the whole. Uh, the accumulation of knowledge in our society, and so so when you say, you, you you think about you, when you talk about uh, assessment, well, uh, you will have you can see the individual, you can try and assess what that individual knows, and I will say that uh, when you think about connectivism, there is, this is not a a discussion, or, or we're not. We're not talking about uh, living behind the idea that something is happening in the student, mm -hmm. in the, the learner. Okay. Uh, something's happening there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's biological. Okay. It's impossible not to, to take into account that. But I would say that, um, that that leads us to a more sophisticated view as, of assessment because you cannot assess everything that is happening with someone. Right, exactly. Because yeah. even, even myself, I don't know the totality of the things that I know. Exactly. Because there are a lot of connections that are maybe dormant uh -huh. and that can be firing in a way uh, in, in some time because something that happened in my environment. So assessment is going to be always partial. Really Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, and, and, and that's really, to me, that's, that's a very interesting difference because we have this presumption in our educational systems that everyone starts in the same place and everyone's supposed to be at the same place at the end of some time. And give a number. Yeah, and we assign a number to say uh, these, these people know all they have to know, but we grow in, a different, in different ways uh, as individuals. Uh, that growth is, is based on not only our classroom experiences, but our history, our, the people we connect with, the, the access to devices, the access to ideas that we have. So it's, it's, really, it's really a challenge in terms of, of assessment. Yes. How do you assess people? And, and well, Stephen, you have wrote a lot about uh, open evaluation, open assessment, mm -hmm. and that kind of things. Well, yeah, because let's think about how we know that we know something. And, and you were talking about this just before, right? Um, what is knowledge anyways, right? Uh, to know something is to not be able to not know it. And I know that sounds like you know, pretty circular, but... <laughs> It took me a long yeah. time to get my head okay. on that. <laughs> but, but think about it, right? If, if you go to the airport and you see your mother in the crowd, right? How do you know that you see your mother in the crowd? Well, you recognize her, right? So it's a recognition thing. It's patterns, maybe. It, it's patterns, right? But how do you know that you know it? Because when you look at your mother, you cannot not know who it's your mother, right? It, it's almost like you're forced to say, yes, this is my mother. I can't unknow that. Okay. Um, you know, you see the color red. You can't think, oh, that's blue, right? <laughs> not possible. Uh, you taste a bad cheese. You cannot untaste it. Okay. It's that kind of way, right? So now let's ask, how do we know somebody has qualified for a certificate? Right? Well, what we do now is we do a test, but like Diego says, it's very partial. Right? It's, it's, we're, we're, it's like trying to recognize your mother by looking at her eyes, looking at her nose, looking at her hair, right? And it might be your mother or it might be someone that looks similar to your mother or, you know, but it's, it's very cumbersome and it's not reliable. That's not how you would recognize your mother. So how do we recognize someone who's achieved the certificate? You get an expert, somebody who can already see whether or not somebody has achieved the certificate, and you recognize in the behavior and in the actions of that person that they have achieved the certificate. See what I mean? Yes. Okay, and that's actually how we do it. 
I don't have tests and all of that, but they will not let you practice medicine unless a doctor who is already qualified watches you work and says, yes, this person's a doctor. So now the open assessment is where we have not just one expert recognizing, but where we have the community recognizing. So I do my work to qualify for the certificate in the open. Uh, I post my work online. I write, I draw, maybe, I make a video, uh, I try to build something. And then people in the community look at the work that I've done and they can recognize whether I am successful in that or not. And each person has a different perspective. Each person has a different point of view and a different understanding of what it is to pass that certificate. But overall, the network of people acts as a large perceiving engine that recognizes whether I've succeeded. Okay. And, and I would say that in, at the end of the day, it's, it's really not something that uh, disruptive maybe when you think about pedagogy, because we've been, we've been talking for a long time about authentic tasks, for example. Mm -hmm. It's that. It's yeah. exactly that. And we, 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 have, we have been talking a lot about uh, a, 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 um, assessment uh, between peers. Mm -hmm. It's that. You, you have the communities. Uh -huh. Just that now we have the possibility to have extended communities exactly. that can uh, assess the value of the things you're doing. And, and yeah. obviously that, that, uh, that has uh, two phases also. Uh -huh. Because if you don't have what CIFO would call a healthy network, uh, you can end up validating something that it's not uh, yeah, that's a really good point. real, uh, that has not uh, intrinsic value. Exactly. Uh, Building on that idea you're talking about, uh, what about with MOOCs? What, what is the opportunities with MOOCs? Uh, what is what the challenge about assessment and peer work and recognition of knowledge? What happened with MOOCs? There is a natural connection between connectivism and MOOCs. It's the same question with what is the relation between education and ICT? It's natural? No. Many people have said we have to think very well about the relation between education and technology. Mm -hmm. What happens with connectivism and MOOCs? They are connected naturally or what are the boundaries or how one underpins the other? What do you think about that? Please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always want to go first. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 but come on, we're talking about MOOCs. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I mean, there's different ways to look at it. One way to look at it is this. Um, when we built our first MOOCs, we decided we want to create a network. And this is 2008. 2008. 2008. Yeah. yeah. So society is a network, your work environment is a network, we want the learning environment to be a network. Mm -hmm. And so we created the MOOC. Uh, and that's, that's the connection between connectivism and MOOC. Right? A MOOC is an example or an instance of learning in a network, pure and simple. So, but you might ask, and this is something that we've learned by offering MOOCs, you might ask, well, why do you need a MOOC? Why don't you just learn in the community? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, right? I mean, why do you need school at all? Why do you need classes at all? And what, what I've discovered, at least, is it's like a MOOC is a temporary network, right? You know, it's a network you can join and then leave. And this is really useful because, remember we talked about how connections form, right? Well, what happens is, if you just live and work the same way every day, every day, every day, your mind kind of settles into this really sort of stable configuration. And your comfort zone. So your speak. comfort zone. <laughs> exactly. And it becomes really hard to learn new things. Okay. Right? So put somebody in an unusual circumstance where they're talking to new people, talking about new things, right? And it's like shaking up the network. And now your connections begin to reform again. You still have the network you used to have, but now it's a little different. Interesting. So, and that's what... That's, you know, we didn't plan that, didn't realize ahead of time that that would be the case, but after the fact, you look at all the different connections between people that were created, all the different ideas that were created, it seems to me, anyways, that that is what happened. 
Wow. But, uh, you got, yes, I, was, I have a question for you, yeah. precisely building on, on the ideas of, of Stephen. It's about, you, I read a, a paper of you, of you describing two types of MOOCs, because when we say MOOCs, people think, think about one type of MOOC, but actually there are two different MOOCs, the MOOCs with C connectivism and other kinds of MOOCs with X, maybe? I yeah, know. this is something that uh, George Simmons uh, stated in a way, right? He, he wrote in his, in his blog about, uh, well, now that we have uh, uh, two different models, one connectivist MOOC, MOOC uh, where you have, you're working in the open network, and another emerging model where you have uh, courses in a closed system. Uh, Commercialized. Well, in some cases, commercial, okay, uh -huh. uh, and well, anyway, uh, that's that's the point. But the point is that you have two different models, and and in terms of language, I have learned that it's it's really important the way you describe things and to make sure that we're really talking about the same things. Mm -hmm. So b because I have seen in the last few years in Colombia, uh, I mean, the the interest about MOOCs has grown incredibly. But when you ask people when was the f when was the first time they heard about that, they will say 2011. Yeah. And so, so what they get is uh, the idea of a course centralized where thousands of people join, which is good, it makes yeah. sense, it, it's useful for so many mm -hmm. things, but where you're maybe um, you're maybe not using uh, this potential of the open network uh, in the best way possible. There, there are things happening there. You can't deny that. But um, the, 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 end, the, the, the focus, I would say, the, the, the interesting thing about the connectivist MOOCs is that they try to, to empower people yeah. to own their own spaces, to create their own, not, to create their own, uh, I won't, I, I was, to create their own content. Because content, you know, in the end, it's uh, an external representation of the things you have in your head, a partial representation of that. So creating content is important. And being able to publish that content and share it with the world and develop the skills to do that and be responsible about the way you handle your content wow. is critical. Sorry for talking about, again, assumptions, but when you're talking about that, I, I, I imagine an issue that emerged is the problem of freedom. You assume Absolutely. that an apprentice wants to learn by its own, his own, her own pace. He's free to decide what to choose, when to abandon, or get into the course again. We are assuming that people wants to be free to decide. And do you think that people um, in our culture environment is willing to face that kind of model so open? The I thing mean, is that people not only not only with like freedom, but of course we have to offer new possibilities to uh, face them to the freedom of choosing. But do you learning. see? Uh -huh. And, and I, I will give uh, Stephen uh, mm -hmm. a moment to talk about that in a minute because uh, that's something that I really liked about the way he frames things, and is that in the end we're not talking about technology. We're not talking about yeah, devices, we're not exactly. talking about access, we're talking about what kind of society we want, mm -hmm. what kind of, of citizens we want. Mm -hmm. Is digital citizenship uh, doing your errands online? And it's that, or is something different? How, how does our, our relation with corporations, with the state change? Are we training our students for that? Uh, and, and in the end, it goes to a very philosophical, and very, uh, I don't know, even, even, even an ideology. You, you, you're taking a stand and you're saying, this is the world I'm, 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 I, I'm interested in and I'm trying to develop that. Uh, I don't know, Stephen, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and it's interesting, it's in, really interesting to me that you said, you know, in the Colombian context, do you really think people want to be free? The one that I know. And that well, of course, <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I learned some important lessons about freedom in Bogota when I was in Bogota the first time in 2006, yep. right? Oh. And, yeah, and I wandered around my last day in the city. It was the first day I felt really comfortable wandering around. It was my first time in Colombia. It was my first time in Latin America. And I wandered through the parks, and I saw people getting together and dancing, people getting together and singing, organizing themselves. Mm -hmm. 
and I, I took video and there's, there's group after group after group after group of people. There was a road race taking place, uh, you know, and of course, as you know, in Bogota, they closed the highways on Sunday, people cycle. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that was the very image of people wanting freedom and exercising freedom, right? And when you see something like that, it becomes impossible to say people don't want freedom. You cannot not see it, all right? And any time, you know, any time you see this kind of creativity, you cannot not see it. Uh, you see art on the street, you see statues, you see people singing, writing poems, making movies, recording videos. All of this they do because they want to do it. You know, yes, it's true that, you know, socially we need people to do certain jobs. Yes, it's true that there are some things that in our current society people have to learn. But left to their own devices, the vast majority of people will learn, and, and they will learn on their own. They will choose their own objectives and they will achieve valuable skills. And that's the concept of a free society. That's the concept of free learning. Interesting. And the other side of this too is because we assume you know, a person can't make these kind of decisions themselves. They're not qualified to know what they know or <coughs> know what they should know and all of that. But nobody's talking about learning alone, are they? We don't learn alone. We learn yeah. in society. We learn in a community. And people yeah, form these societies and these communities. If somebody wants to know something, they ask someone who knows. Interesting. You know? Um, we don't need to force them to do this. They will do this. And so the role, and this is probably one of the key ideas of MOOCs, and one of the key ideas of connectivism, the role of the educator, the role of the education system, changes from being that instrument that provides all the information you need to learn, that, that makes people learn, yes. to being the instrument to support and help people learn the things that they want to learn. Now, now I obviously, I will say that um, it's it's important to keep in mind that context uh, matter. Context, context matters, matters a lot, Always. and 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 it's not the environment that you are, but the social conditions, the cultural conditions, mm -hmm. the economic conditions. That's important because at times, and I have seen people uh, going like that. This is a call to end school, but when you think about the. Uh, the, the, the Latin American context, the Colombian context. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need the schools yeah. because we don't have, I mean, you need a rich network one to, to develop this kind of uh, autonomy meet. learning. But the That's real, right. what we see every now and then is that in, in many places in our society, we don't have those culturally rich environments. Uh, in many places, we're trapped by media. Yeah. Just by the things that media is feeding us. So we yeah. do need a school, but we do need, I would say, a school that uh, that takes seriously its role as opening windows to the world, as, as shaking the network. Say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And, and, and that's interesting because huh? these are not, I would say, these are not. Uh, 2010 or 2014 ideas. This is something that's in education. It's been there long from for a long time, but we haven't been able to do it yet. And I will say that with uh, technology, we have an interesting opportunity. Interesting. Now, mm -hmm. if we keep using technology only to search for information, only to feed ourselves information, uh, and not to use it as as, as a creation tools and uh, a support for our learning we're wasting a huge potential of technology. Interesting. And I think that's a challenge for all of us working in this. What, what, are, really, really, what are we really doing? That's are we so uh, passionate about uh, whatever LMS we're using that we miss the point, that we lose perspective of the challenges, of the things that we can create? And, and I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult discussion, of course, but I think it's the most important discussion. Okay.
interesting. Because there are a lot of changes in the in the environment at this time. I, I every day I'm, I'm a bit more concerned about what we're doing with with our data. Mm -hmm. Like for for example, uh, mm -hmm. the, our minister of, of uh, ICT announced that he intends to uh, give uh, every citizen of the country um, an online space, an official email mm -hmm. address, place where you can save your things and where, where your personal information, your ID card, and your social security number, all that will be there. So, who's gonna get that contract? Google. Or I don't know the use cool. of the big data. And the, and the thing, yeah, that. who's oh, going to use that? And we're not talking answer. about that. Exactly. We're not talking about that. And I do believe, and in, in the line of the work of Gene Groom and, and sure, yeah. you know that we need to start that conversation. We yeah. need to train our students and our uh -huh. teachers to to, to to see that in the world, so they can they won't be able to not see. <laughs> that. <laughs> interesting. I think that's a real challenge. Okay, thank you very much for all of you for the discussion. It's been very interesting. You want to say something else? Oh, it's nice to Final see you thoughts. Again. Yeah, <laughs> it's great to see you again. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, final thoughts. What, what are the challenges? As you see well, it? I mean, uh, that's, you, you, you describe that as a challenge for Colombia, but of course, it's a challenge for the world. The world. Uh, you know, in Canada, we have the same situation, not exactly the same program, but when people put their, their content online, uh, when the people put their identity online. Who owns that? Uh, who does that belong to? Can they make it disappear for no particular reason? I mean, these are important fundamental questions. And, you know, freedom and learning and, and ownership and control are all tied together. And, and you might think, well, we've gone a long way from connectivism. But, you know, Diego talked about, you know, for recognition to work properly we need a properly functioning network yeah. and a properly functioning network isn't one that's controlled and it isn't one that's constrained uh, for networks to work the individual nodes have to be autonomous they have to be free to communicate with each other they have to be diverse to each be doing a different thing and and the network has to be open and without that you, you warp and constrain the network, and the risk is that, you know, as the network becomes warped and constrained, it becomes less rational, it becomes less able to identify phenomena, less able to react, and eventually stagnates and dies. So these principles, these are principles not just of, you know, this is good learning, but these are principles of how to make a network work fundamentally, and that's why they're important. Uh, and just to, to to say something more about that, um, I would say those those principles are very good guideline in the design of learning environments. Yeah. I've used it that way, and and so it, it's interesting to me. I mean, all the discussion about whether uh, connectivism is a theory or isn't a theory. To me, in fact, I know it, maybe I'm being way too pragmatic, but what I see is that. There I have a, a, a set of ideas and principles Two that blocks, resonate with the way I feel I learn, okay. which is important, I, I would say. Uh, that resonates with me. And also, I have a set of ideas, a set of principles that help me to think about the way I design learning environments. So, uh, going back to the MOOCs, uh, I, I would say that the, re the broad question is how do you design network-based environments? Mm -hmm. yes. How do you create a distributed network mm -hmm. in your classroom? Mm -hmm. And when you start to see the world from that perspective, it's maybe you're doing something that has to do with connectivism. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not. But you are putting that emphasis, emphasis in, in, in networks. And mm -hmm. I would say that that's important because network is another of those metaphors of our time. So the implications for yeah. teachers are design. It's a matter of design with criteria, an open criteria. It's a matter of design, but it's a matter of also of, of being an example, of yeah. being a role model uh -huh. of the things that you can do in that kind of environment. Yeah, very good point. Thank you very much for all you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>